And you know, I've had my car in three different shops. Yours is the first place that did the job right. What's more, the bill was surprisingly light. I'll sure let my friends know about your wonderful service. Say, Lee, did I hear right? Did I just hear that customer say he was actually happy to pay his service bill? You heard that customer all right. Tell about your secret, Lee. Sure, Tech. I just used a voltage drop check to find a loose ammeter connection, Bert. Took me about 15 minutes. You mean that's all you did? What was so special about that? Well, Bert, that customer's battery was low and hardly turned the engine over. The ammeter didn't show charge either. Two other shops looked at his car. One put in a new generator, the other place installed a new generator regulator. In both cases, that customer was rocked by bills he got for new parts and labor. And he still had the same condition. Now, some guys never learn that it pays to get at the real cause of the condition first. Yeah, Lee. Anybody can replace parts. But a real mechanic who knows electricity would have tackled the job the way you did. Sure, Tech. And sometimes that's all anybody needs, to win the respect and confidence of the customer. Well, I guess that leaves me out. I know next to nothing about electricity. I'd have put in those new parts myself. Maybe so, Bert. But Lee's just the man to get you better acquainted with electrical fundamentals. Actually, Tech, that's why I did that job myself. I've been meaning to go into electricity with Bert, but until last night, I didn't have the up-to-date story. Up-to-date? What's up-to-date about electricity? Well, the electronic side of the electrical story, for one thing. We covered that at a special service manager's meeting. It's the modern approach to explaining electricity and helps clear it up. After all, you can't see or watch electricity. It's invisible. All you can see is the job it does, like, uh, well, like the burning of a headlight. Yeah, and you can feel it, Lee. I know. <laughs> yeah, very true, Tech. It's an invisible, powerful force you can feel. So... Let's talk about the basic nature of this electrical force, or energy, and how it flows. Okay, you've got me curious. Fine. Now, to understand electricity, keep in mind what we know about the makeup of matter. Matter, whether liquid, gas, or solid, like this battery ground cable, is anything that takes up space, has weight, and size. All matter is composed of tiny particles known as atoms. There are about a hundred different types of atoms which can be combined to form different kinds of matter. Now, for example, two atoms of hydrogen, a gas, and one atom of oxygen, another gas, unite to form one particle or molecule of water. Now, that's why chemists call water H2O. Oh, so everything is made up of either the same type of atom or of combinations of different types of atoms. Exactly. And since everything is made of atoms, let's look closely at an atom. Each atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons form the core, or nucleus, of the atom. The electrons rotate in fixed paths, or orbits, around the nucleus. It's like our solar system, Bert. The sun with other planets spinning around in their own orbits. Right. And here's the electrical side of the atom story. Electrons are tiny, negatively charged particles. Since they all have the same charge, they try to stay as far away from each other as possible. Then what holds the atom together? Well, the protons in the nucleus are positively charged particles. They attract the electrons. Now, that's what holds each atom together. The neutrons, being neutral, just aid in keeping the balance. In other words, all atoms in all matter contain positive and negative charges. These charges have no practical use until they're set in motion in the form of an electrical current that can be put to useful work. Now, here's how that current is set up. First, remember that these atoms have an equal number of negative and positive charges. The atom could be said to be in balance. The charges are neutralized, and there is no usable flow of electrons from the atom. Now, when the balance within the atom is upset so that there are more electrons, negative charges, than protons, positive charges, some electrons will move from the atom. And therefore, you have to get electrons to leave their atoms and move to other atoms in order to set up a flow of electricity, something you can put to work. Right. 
And here's something else. Since the electrons are negatively charged, they repel each other. So, an electron that moves repels the electron next to it, causing that electron to move away. That electron, in turn, causes the next electron to move, and so on. Remember, a copper wire is made up of billions of copper atoms. When electricity flows through that wire, it's the free electrons of those copper atoms that move from atom to atom in the wire. We can say, then, that an electric current is a stream of free electrons moving from atom to atom in a conductor. Here's a down-to-earth example. Compare the flow of current to the old bucket brigade. One man at the well draws water and passes it to his neighbor. He passes it along to the next man, and so on, until the water reaches the fire. The water moves from man to man like electrons move from atom to atom. The water passes back from fire to well, completing the circuit. In this example, the well is like a battery. The water is the electrons. The people are the atoms. Putting out the fire is the useful work. Firing a spark plug is useful work. I understand that, but uh, upsetting the balance of negative and positive charges inside each atom to start the flow, how is that done? Well, that's where the battery and generator get into the act. In the battery, for instance, the electrolyte atoms react with the lead plate atoms. That forms new atoms with a surplus of electrons. These surplus electrons set up a pressure. When that pressure is released by connecting a wire to the battery, the surplus or free electrons move out into the wire by way of the negative terminal. That's the story, Bert. The battery and generator only cause electricity already in existence to move in one direction. They don't create electricity any more than a pump creates water. Yeah. And since electrons also travel along the outside of the wire, they could easily jump off to any other metal, causing a short circuit. That's why we cover the wire with insulating materials which resist the passage of electrons. Glass, rubber, and porcelain are good insulating materials. Their electrons are held so tightly together, they can't move freely from atom to atom. You'd almost think each electron had a big ball and chain to keep it close to home. I understand why those materials are good insulators. Now, what are good conductors? Oh, silver, copper, aluminum, and steel, Bert. Electrons of those materials rotate freely in their orbits. These electrons can pass easily from atom to atom throughout the material. Silver is the best conductor, but it's too expensive. So, copper is the most widely used material. Copper is a good conductor. It's strong and doesn't cost very much. You mentioned current flow, Lee. So why not brush Bert up on bolts, amps, and ohms? Yeah, that's a good idea. Now, you remember, Bert, that electricity moves through a circuit at a certain pressure measured in volts. Yeah, like water pressure is measured in pounds per square inch. Right, and technically speaking, a volt is the pressure needed to push a certain number of electrons or cause current to flow past a given point in one second. I understand. The volts give the electrons the big push. That's right. And in a car, voltage is produced by chemical reaction of the battery and by the mechanical action of the generator. Yeah, and speaking of action, somebody better turn the record over or we're going to be out of action. Now, Bert, you know a flow meter measures the amount of water flowing through a pipe. Yeah, yeah. Well, with an ammeter, you can measure the amount of electricity flowing through a wire. An ampere, or amp as we call it, is a unit of measurement that indicates the amount of current flow. The more amps that flow through a wire, the larger that wire must be. Just like a large pipe will carry more water than a small pipe. Say, that's right. More current is needed to crank the engine than is needed to light the lights. So that's why there's a large cable from the battery to the starting motor and a small wire from the switch to the lights. You get the idea, Bert. Okay, but uh, couldn't you poke up the voltage and get more current to flow through the same size wire? Well, up to a certain point, yes. But there's a limit to what the wire can stand. 
Right. If you increase voltage on a small wire to force it to carry more amps, it'll get hot and might even burn. Now, here's another thing that affects the flow of electricity. Suppose your garden hose gets kinked while you're watering the lawn. What happens to pressure at the nozzle? Why, it falls off to practically nothing. Exactly, my boy. That's because that kink offers resistance to the flow of water through the hose. And the same thing happens when there's a corroded connection in a circuit. That corrosion offers resistance to the flow of electricity. The unit fed through that wire doesn't get enough current to operate at top efficiency. In other words, resistance lowers the voltage and can be measured in terms of voltage drop. The easiest way to check for electrical resistance is to use a voltmeter. Measure the voltage up to the suspected corroded terminal, then at the terminal itself. The difference is the voltage drop caused by the corrosion at the terminal. Now remember, there's always a difference of voltage between any two points of the circuit, no matter how small the current or how low the resistance, as long as current is flowing. Oh, I see. If voltage drop is pretty big, that's our clue to look for a loose, rusty, or corroded connection somewhere in the circuit. And headlight wiring, that could dim the lights because corrosion won't conduct electricity. Right. Now, let's say a loose connection begins to corrode. Corrosion narrows down the path through which the electrons flow. Narrowing the path increases resistance like kinking a hose. That, in turn, increases the heat at the point of corrosion, and heat produces more corrosion. Gosh, and all that trouble can start with a loose connection? Yeah, but don't just go tightening up a loose connection. Get it good and clean first. Right, Tech. Cleanliness is the number one item where electrical connections are concerned. Now, just by way of summary, amperage is the rate of electron flow through a circuit. Voltage is the force at which amperage is delivered to the lamp. The amount of current flowing through a conductor depends on the amount of voltage and the amount of resistance. So, let's take a look at resistance. If it's hard to move the electrons from one atom to another, the conductor has high resistance. Yeah, Bert, and there's something else. Resistance varies with the size of the conductor. The bigger it is, the more atoms it's got, and the more electrons which can be moved around. Oh, yeah, Tech. That size is mighty important. Now, uh, think of wire as a one-way bridge. A car going over that bridge is like an electron. If there's just one row of electrons flowing over that bridge, everything's okay. But try to shove three or four lanes of cars over that bridge and wham, the bridge can't take it. The same thing's true with a wire. That's why using the specified size wire is important. Now, let's talk about automobile wiring circuits. It'll be simpler to think of them as a single wire from the battery to, well, say the headlights. Instead of a return wire, the headlights are grounded to the frame. The positive battery terminal is also grounded to the frame. Electricity flows from the negative terminal to all units. It returns to the battery by way of the frame through the positive terminal. That brings up a very vital point. Since the steel frame and ground wires are half of the whole circuit, don't spend all your time servicing just the hot wires going to the units. That's a good point, Tech. That current's got to get back. Say, take a look at this corroded clamp on the battery ground cable I replaced on my car. The current from all the units sure had a hard time getting back to the battery through that. No wonder my battery needed recharging. That a boy, Bert. And remember, some electrical energy is used up through actual operation of the units. For example, energy is converted to light in the headlight and to mechanical motion in the starter. That's why it's so important to get the full battery voltage to each unit with as little loss as possible. If the used energy isn't replaced, the battery would be completely discharged very quickly. And that's where the generator comes in, eh? Right. The generator replaces energy lost by the battery. The generator also provides energy for ignition and other units when the engine is operating. Exactly how the battery and generator produce electrical energy are 
broad subjects in themselves, so we'll have to cover them at another meeting. Let's stick to practical applications of those things we've covered up to now. For instance, I think those fellows who installed new parts in that owner's car were basically honest and meant well. They were just afraid of electricity or didn't understand it well enough to use test instruments. Actually, the ammeter and voltmeter are easy to use. They save time, money, and effort in the long run, and they help us keep the customers happy. You'd still better give me a brush up on those test instruments, Lee. Okay. Now, we use this ammeter to measure current flow in a circuit. It sort of counts the electrons as they pass through it. Now, when you hook an ammeter into a circuit, remember to connect it so the current will go in one terminal and out the other. Yeah, and remember that the ammeter is kind of frail. It's got very little resistance. If it gets the full surge of battery current by itself, it can go poof up in a cloud of smoke. Yeah, Tech's right. Don't short circuit the ammeter. Always connect it in series with a high resistance unit, like the headlight, to hold back the full flow of electrons. That keeps current down to safe limits. On the other hand, the voltmeter has high resistance. You can connect it across the circuit from hot wire to ground, so long as the voltage isn't higher than the voltmeter's range. Okay, Lee. I'll keep that in mind. Okay, fine. Now, this morning, I first checked the customer's battery. It wasn't up to full charge, so I temporarily installed a battery that was fully charged. Then I started the engine. With a voltmeter, I checked the voltage drop between the battery lead and the hot post of the starter solenoid. It was well within limits. I then checked at the hot terminal of the ammeter. At that point, there was a definite indication of an excessive voltage drop. A corroded, loose connection was the trouble. And once I cleaned and tightened it, the excessive voltage drop disappeared and the ammeter began to show charge. And that was that. Nice going, Lee. Now Bert ought to have an entirely new slant on electricity. If every mechanic will study this reference book, he'll know what to expect from electricity he can't see. He'll have new confidence and ability to do a good job on any electrical work that comes along. And that, after all, is what our customers want and exactly why we're all in the service business. <laughs>